Hi everyone, Sylvia here with you again. The last time I was with you sharing, I shared with you from Jeremiah 16 and 19. And in essence, it tells us that our forefathers inherited lies that did not profit them or avail them anything. And we inherited those same lies from them. I really felt God leading me to share even more because, again, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 31 and verses 1 through 4. And then I'm going to read a few verses out of Jeremiah chapter 30. But they clearly show again that in so many cases, we inherited lies. And any gospel that does not include the Jews and God's love for them is not the gospel that God uh, desires for us to understand. It's not the truth of the word of God. And I just believe that we're in a season and a time when God is asking us as believers to return back to him, to return back the truth of his word, not to believe uh, the word of God as one that has left out a major portion because Israel is a major portion. Israel is a the heart of God. And again, if we have theologies, if we have um if we have beliefs and our faith does not include them, then we have inherited lies and it's simply not the truth. And we've been told that the replacement theory, that they were replaced by the Gentile church, the Christians, it's not so. Because see, the body of Christ, Christians, is comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. We must remember that he's partially blind them for a season, but he's promised that he's going to restore them. He's promised about a new covenant that he has for and with them. God has never forsaken Israel. Has he bought righteous judgments? Yes. But again, it was so they could return, so that they could see the error of their ways and return back to their creator, the one who loves them, the one who desires them more than anyone. See, in fact, they are the only nation that God created specifically for himself. He didn't take them out of another nation and then just begin to start calling them Israel. No, he conceived. He is the one that again caused them from a covenant he made with Abraham, continued with Isaac and Jacob, the 12 tribes, and then caused them to come into a large nation led out of captivity by Moses, but all for the purposes of God. And God married them like a husband marries a wife. And he has never forsaken and given up on his bride. In fact, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, so that that covenant, they could, he could marry them again. Because he knows that, again, marriage is to be until death do them part. It is the covenant that is an example of the covenant. It is to be everlasting, not interchangeable like shoes, but everlasting. God stands on covenant has not changed and it never will. So his relationship with Israel is an everlasting covenant. We must understand that, know that. And I really want to speak to those that say, I'm an intercessor. If you are intercessing, meaning you're praying, you're that one that God has called to stand in the gap between him and the land. If your intercession does not include Israel, praying for their restoration, praying for them to return, to come to know him as their beloved once again, then something is missing out of your intercession. And you too have received lies and inherited them because we receive the inheritance of the exclusion of them or the replacement of them. And none of that is true. Excuse me just a minute. None of that is true. Glory be unto God. Amen. God loves them and he wants you and I to stand in the gap, giving him no rest until again he reestablished them, until they return to him, until they return to Israel and they're right back in love with the one who loves them. 
God loves them. And again, that should be an encouragement to us because if he won't give up on them in the things that they have done, the wrongs that they have done, then he surely won't give up on us. And as he has given them opportunity after opportunity, so he will do with you and I. But we cannot take that for granted. We must understand and know that God desires this. Now, I want to get into some reading. And when I look at and I read again, Jeremiah 31, he says, At that time, declares the Lord, I will be glad. I will be God of all the clans of Israel and they shall be my people. Do you see? This is what God is saying. He has a set time where he's going to be their God. They're going to be their his, they will be his people. It's already started. It started in 1948 when he reestablished the land of Israel. And he's been calling them to return home ever since. He says, thus says the Lord, the people who survived the, the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. And he says this to them. Listen, listen here. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. God is speaking to Israel. Now, as Christians, we often read the scripture as it belonging only to us. And it's okay for us to apply it to ourselves. But don't forget to apply it to whom it applies to. God is speaking through Jeremiah to the nation of Israel, to the Hebrews, to the Jews. And this was written for them. We get to be partakers. Why? Because we've been grafted into the original olive tree. We are joint heirs. But again, joint heirs that mean equal heirs. Remember in Leviticus, he had specific things for the firstborn and their inheritance was greater but everyone inherited something. Everyone's inheritance is good. But again, the firstborn, and they are the firstborn. So let's be okay with the firstborn having a greater inheritance. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us because he does. Amen. Let, let's keep on reading. He says, again, I will build you and you shall be built. O version Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and shall go forth in the dance of the merry makers. God is promising that he's going to take their mourning and turn it into joy. They just went through the ninth of off. It's a time of mourning, of mourning. But God has promised that their mourning is going to become rejoicing. Can we pray for their rejoicing? Because the greater they can rejoice, the greater the rejoicing will be for us. It's one family. We are one family in God through Christ Jesus. And we should learn to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are, re are mourning. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. And planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. He's telling this to Israel. They're going to enjoy the fruit of their labor. He's going to restore them. He's going to return them. How great and awesome is that? That. This is the truth of God's word. He has not, nor will he forsake his people. Amen. He says, for there shall be a day when watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim, arise and let's go to Zion. Where is Zion? Zion is in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. That's the very place that Jesus is going to rule and reign from. And we will join him there with our fellow brothers and sisters, the Jews. Amen. And he says, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. Oh, that should make us just say hallelujah. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nation. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the furthest parts of the earth. Along, among them, the blind, the lame, the pregnant woman, she who is in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come and with Please for mercy, I will lead them back. I will make them walk by the brook, brooks of water. He's saying every one of them, he's going to bring them back in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. 
For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Saints, we must understand again, he wrote this to the Jews. This applies to them. Amen. Now, can we use it? Can we call it as our own? Yes, but we can't leave them out because it was written to them for them. And we must become an integral part in God returning them. Now, I want to um, read this when he says, and the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the heights of Zion and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden and they shall lavish no more. God is promising them abundance. He's promising them a life without measure. He's promising them. We must pray because until Israel receives their inheritance, Christians, Gentiles, we cannot receive ours. See, they are God's inheritance and there is no real inheritance without the firstborn receiving theirs. Amen. Their re getting into position, receiving God and their inheritance is and does impact us. And we cannot take it lightly. And we must pray without ceasing. Amen. Because we want the family to be whole. We want the family to be one. Why should Christians pray for Jews? Because it has a direct impact on our inheritance because we are one in Christ Jesus. And it is, again, a family that is partially a family is not a family. We want the fullness of the family. Then shall the young women rejoice the dance and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Amen. How awesome, how wonderful is that? Saints, our prayers matter. Your prayers matter. Our understanding the truth matters. Glory be unto God. And then in Jeremiah 30 and 10, he says this. Again, he's speaking to Israel. This is the truth of the word of God. As I said earlier, any gospel, any theology, anything that does not include the Jews first is an inherited lie. And it's time for the lies to stop and the truth to go forward. In 10, he says, therefore, fear not, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, neither be dismayed. O Israel, for I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of thy captivity. Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, all nations, where, where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a end to you. I will not make an end to you, but I will correct you in measure and will not leave them altogether unpunished. See, God is saying exactly what he is going to do. Amen. Glory be unto God. God's love for Israel is without question, without doubt. If you don't have that same love, Will you join me in praying and asking God to cause you and I to love Israel, to love the Jews the way that he does, to cry out day and night for our family until it is restored. For we are one family in Christ Jesus. See, that's what pleases the heart of the father. Do you want his heart to be pleased? Then let us pray. And in so doing so, as he brings revelation, can we be among those that will share the truth? And the truth is God loves Israel. He loves the Jews. He has never forsaken them. And he still has a plan and a purpose for them. And he wants them as much as he wants you and I. They are part of the body of Christ. They are part of the church. And in becoming 
He's not requiring that they become less Jew any more than he's required for us to become Jew. He knew and meant from the very beginning, it would be Jew and Gentile that would rise up into the full statue of the one perfect man, Jesus Christ. And in so doing, the world would know that he and he alone is the Lord. He is the God of all creation, the God of the universe. He is God and he's God alone. Saints, can we together do our part? Let's become educated in the truth because the Holy Spirit reveals it and then share it with others without excuse. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy today's reading. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks.